You're listening to The Successors Podcast with Kara Oosterhuis on realagriculture.com. Welcome, folks. It's time for episode 14 of The Successors Podcast. I am your host, Kara Oosterhuis, and as always, I am happy you are tuning in. Because if you wouldn't be tuning in, well... I'd be sitting in a room talking to myself. It's officially kidding season here. I may not have human kids, but I have goat kids and hopefully plenty more on the way. It's a busy time of the year, but an enjoyable one nonetheless. So if you're also kidding, lambing, calving, whatever it may be, here's to hoping everything goes smoothly for you and the bottle babies are kept to a minimum. For today's episode of the Successors Podcast, we're headed out east to Uxbridge, Ontario to catch up with Garrett Herma. Garrett, how is it going today? Good. How are you, Kara? I am doing well. Okay, for those that are not familiar with Ontario, tell me where you are located in Ontario. Basically, we're about an hour north east of the city of Toronto. If you if you go straight north of Lake Sim or straight south of Lake Simcoe and straight north of the city of Pickering, uh, you'll pretty much land right in where we are. You know, we're we're in an area where it's very uh, developed area and a lot of a lot of traffic and. Uh, everything else so that's kind of where where we farm out of tell me a bit about your operation what keeps you busy over there for the most part we're uh 85 milking cows and run about 750 to 800 acres of cropland run a bit of a custom farming operation largely big square baling a little bit of planting um and then custom silage bagging as well so that's pretty much what keeps us busy but Definitely the cows are where our uh, priorities are at. So have you always been involved in dairy? Was that a family operation before you came into it? Or or talk a bit about that. Yeah, it's a bit of a family history. We immigrated from Holland on the Harima side back in 1951, I believe. Uh, First settlement was actually in Uxbridge where we worked for a a neighboring farm. Uh, Worked there for about a year and then uh two or three farms between Oxbridge and King City which is just uh, about a half hour north of Toronto worked on two farms there and then the family rented two farms in that area for 10 years milking cows they finally were able to purchase the the home farm in 1960 where they uh moved up and my grandfather Gary and his dad Wilbur farmed up there getting into the 80s and the 90s my dad and my uncle ron farmed together in the early 2000s my dad decided to take on municipal politics did that for 10 years and then um, my uncle decided to retire and dad said he was going to retire from politics and here we are and right now currently it's myself and my dad primarily my sister's been back home for a little bit but she's heading off she's in the, the livestock showing circuit with uh, the dairy sign more so. So she's heading off with that. And uh, yeah, that's kind of a bit of a, a hit farm history for uh, for where what we have here. So your dad is still currently involved with the farm? Yes, very. He's, he, he's head honcho. Wow. I, I think it's actually mother that's head honcho because she's <laughs> the one that, that deals with the bucks and says no when we, we want to spend money. Um, but, but dad's kind of top dog around here. And then myself and we have a a real top notch herdsman that, that strictly works with the cows. He doesn't do any field work. Really, really lucky to have him. And a lot of our success, uh, with the dairy over the past 10 years have been because of him. So, but yeah, my, my dad and I work real close together. Always have when he was in politics, we, we, he and I would get a lot of stuff done on weekends because he had meetings during the week. So, uh, we kind of have a, a bit of a synergy when it comes to to what we do, and and he and I can think along the similar lines and be able to think in a way to move the farm forward and get things done. Have you started discussing succession at all, or that hasn't really been a topic that's been breached yet? Well, well, it's definitely been a topic. It's just a matter of getting uh, sitting down and, and starting to plan some stuff. You know, uh, between some family members that are still have are involved with the farm and such and uh, trying to figure out what's best for everyone. So that's something that within the next few years, we're really focused on trying to get done because we want the farm to succeed. 
and, and move on in the future generations. So do you think succession planning is something you guys are going to tackle internally yourselves? Or are you going to bring somebody in to help or, again, haven't really thought that far? I, I think definitely, you know, working with our accountants, the number one uh, thing to to bring in and, and make sure it goes smoothly and make sure that things make sense for, from a, a financial standpoint, tax basis, what have you, and make sure everything's fair for, for the rest of the family members that are still involved. Absolutely. Is there any, any intention for your sister to come back full-time to the farm, do you think? Not not at this present time, but if there is a, an opportunity where she feels she wants to come back, you know, the, the spot is there. You know, she's been as much of a part of an operation as anything, uh, especially on the cow side, not so much the cropping side. It is a family farm, so, so if that's the case you know we we gotta make sure that she's a part of the farm for sure so talk about the dairy operation is there a specific part you fit into or do you guys kind of all work on everything together for the most part i my self-proclaimed title is feed and crop manager so kind of my forte is making sure the crops are in you know we're getting the best yields the best quality feed that we can, you know, dealing everything from, from planting to spraying, working with our agronomist and our feed nutritionist to make sure everything's balanced right. Um, so that's where I fit in. But, you know, uh, of course, kind of, if anyone's away or what have you, I'm the first guy that gets called, whether it's breeding cows or, or treating or whatever. I've taken on the role of, of calf feeding primarily, you know, because it's, you want a good start with the calves, so I've been really focused on that as well. Milking, not so much with my sister being home up until recently. She She's done a lot, a lot of milking and is pretty good at it. So, um, And I like milking. There's nothing wrong with it. But if there's other jobs that I can do while someone else is willing to milk, we'll, we'll go do that. And the other part of where I fit in is seems to be I'm spending a lot more time in the shop working on equipment with the price of shop rate and stuff. If there's the ability... Uh, or if we have the ability to pull something in the shop and work in a, on it ourselves, we, we think we're saving um, quite a bit of money doing that versus having to send it off to a dealer that, that's charging, you know, 100 to 120 bucks an hour for shop rate, right? which they got to in order to make their ends meet. But at the same time, if we can do it more affordably at home, we're seeing a big benefit for sure. And I know right to repair is something we talk about frequently here. Do you find there's there's a lot of things you can't actually work on in the shop that you have to send away because you just simply don't have the, the tech or the programs to fix it? Yes, short answer. We're 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 all red equipment on the on the tractor side anyways. So um, I haven't really seen anything come through, at least on the media end, on what Case's plan is with right to repair. But definitely it's in the back of my mind that are we going to have to look at um, some of these packages uh, in order to, more so to diagnose. I think that's the biggest thing for me is diagnosing it, not necessarily repairing it. A lot of this stuff is nuts and bolts unless you're getting into some other stuff. But di- diagnosing this stuff seems to be the biggest thing. So we're going to have to be prepared, I think, within the next five years to have that the diagnosing tools available to us, especially if we're going to try and keep up to date on some of the cropping uh, or cropping equipment. It is higher tech stuff. You know, we're, we're dealing with starting to think about variable rate fertilizer. We bought a new planter, but it doesn't have... Um, any variable rate stuff but having said that you know five years down the road maybe it's time we start looking at uh variable rate fertilizer and seed and stuff so so all this stuff is in the back of our mind with our equipment purchases and having those diagnostic diagnostic tools i think is going to be a big benefit coming up and you mentioned you know five years from now talk about technology and especially on the dairy side, like when it comes to milking, how has that changed since, you know, even in the last decade? Well, when you look at robotic technology, robots have come so far compared to the first couple that were at the outdoor farm show back in the the late 90s. For ourselves, we put in a parlor when we built a new barn about six years ago, just from the standpoint of we were too many cows for one robot and not enough cows to justify the second robot. And our between my dad our our herdsmen and everyone else around we seem to have enough labor that we can make a parlor work and and we think it's the right choice our barn is laid out to put in robots if we decide to go that route there's nothing wrong with robots 
it's just whatever fits your operation. They're, they're incredibly, incredibly neat pieces of equipment. And, uh, you know, I, I, I always enjoy listening to neighbors and friends that have them. Data collection on the feed side is something we're starting out with. We're playing around with a, a program that tracks all our feed usage on the mixer. So that's one thing. One upgrade we had on the parlor was we went with these auto post-dipping milk claws. So for those that don't know the, the prep procedure when it comes to milking cows, you, you pre-dip with an iodine, you wipe it off, strip the, the teat out to get any uh, dirt in, in the first little bit of milk out, and then you throw the milker on. And afterwards, after you're done milking, you post-dip with an iodine again to make sure that no, uh, or minimize the amount of of pathogens and stuff that get in the udder. So what technology came out of England, actually, was the ability to post-dip right in the teat cup, and then afterwards it does a sanitized flush for in between each cow. So we're able to significantly reduce our mass data spread within the herd. So that's one techno- piece of technology we've adapted to. This rumination, um, you know, watching the cows digestion and stuff, uh, is something that I think we're going to look towards within the next five to ten years, uh, just to catch those cows that might be off feed earlier. You can track them on the milk production that is read through the the milk meters back to the computer. But rumination, some of the the statistics are showing that you're able to catch these cows a little bit easier. Having said that, you can get carried away with technology. I think yeah, but I I think buying the technology that's going to make your farm more efficient in being able to, to catch these cows that are off sooner, um, I think are the two that, that we're going to really try and focus on. Like you said, there's so much different technology out there. When deciding what is quote unquote right for your farm, do you mostly look at, you know, sticker price? Do you look at what increases efficiency on your farm? What's kind of that determination for you? That's a really great question when when we moved into the new facility it solved a lot of our technology questions i guess when we brought in a milking system that can track milk production and conductivity and blend the milk and activity and all those things so you know those things we I think our priorities when it comes to it. Looking at uh, education, you you obviously did your high school. Did you do any post secondary education? Yeah, um, for for high school, I think one thing that maybe gave me a little bit different experience was I did a co op placement with a welding shop, and that that was just a bit different um, between being able to do a lot of or a little bit more of our own fabrication and stuff, and being able to repair steel and, and, and problems like that. that. That was a big asset. Um, and unfortunately, the shop that I worked at has, has closed up, but I'm still in touch with the boss. And, you know, he's been a, a, a bit of a mentor in, in, in sort of the business side. Post-secondary education, I went to Kempville College, which was a former uh, campus under University of Guelph, where I uh, just did a diploma in agriculture. Uh, but tried to specialize more so on the dairy and side of things. Working alongside my dad so close, he was always the crop guy. So I learned a lot from him. So I wanted to learn a little bit more from cows. In Ontario, for those who don't know, up until recent history, there was three agriculture uh, campuses when I was able to go to school. There was uh, Ridgetown, which is still ex- exists today. Uh, you, you know, you talk about SWAC, a big conference down there. It, it is the uh, one of the better agriculture schools uh, in Canada, in my opinion. Then there was Kempville, which was definitely a dairy-focused school. And then uh, Alfred, which was the French school. So between the three of those covered a lot of the agriculture um, education needs in the area. So that's, yeah, Kempville was a, a learning experience. I mean, 30% of your time was spent in class and the rest of it was networking and meeting with friends. And, you know, there's there's still a tight knit uh, group of us, about a, a dozen of us that talk on a daily basis. So, you, you know, the education part is one thing, but the networking and, and those friends that you, 
you stay along with are, are what's going to really drive you to, to move your business forward. Now, you mentioned your dad being involved in local politics. What exactly did he do there? Uh, he was a, a local ward councillor for six years. So basically just a, a section of the township, mostly in the rural area that he covered. And then from there, he was deputy mayor and regional councillor. So you took the whole township and he represented the regional needs at regional government or county government, pretty similar. So he was there for four years until uh, he decided that he was going to come home full time and farm. So talk about how him being involved with politics, even after he had left politics, how that maybe impacted you and how you were maybe shaped into the farm. Did did you guys talk about policy a lot and things like that or, or not so much? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, discussions around uh, politics is a, is a daily discussion discussion it, it never ends you know, you know I, I think most people when they get into politics they they always have good intentions and want to see the the, the good that you can do in a community and you know it, I don't think it changes when you leave it it's just how you approach leaving municipal government that that makes your years later on what they are yeah we 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 talk policy a lot whether in all levels of government and we're still lucky enough that we're able to connect with those involved in the, in the township if we have concerns um, around issues that we see and as well as, as the provincial level. We have had uh, a lot of support from, from the provincial government and our MPP MLA Tomato Tomato is the finance minister in, in Ontario and we've had two agriculture roundtables with him and we've really appreciated his support and had him out to the the farm. So those two levels of government, um, and, you know, I, I do credit my dad, my grandfather's involvement in politics for that connection. Having said that, you know, want to not, I'm trying to find the right word here, but uh, I want to make my own opinions valid as well and not just use theirs. Because, you know, dad and I do think differently, even though we are alike, but it, you know, b being involved in the community and stuff and, and making sure the right issues are heard with the right people it is incredibly important. Do you ever see yourself getting involved with um, not necessarily mainstream politics, but getting involved with a, an agriculture based board or anything like that? Cur currently, I sit on our local dairy committee. So that's kind of, I don't want to say it's a stepping stone. I, I think it's a, a good place to be from the standpoint of it directly affects the business, so I think it's a good one to be involved in. I don't want to get too involved into politics in my younger years from the standpoint of, you know, starting a family and, and being home for those younger years is important to me. I think in experience is something that maybe is underrated now in the political sphere. There's a lot of young people out there with good ideas, but I think experience needs to speak more volume. So... I'm not saying no, but I'm not saying yes. I'm just like to focus on the business and, and the farm for now and what benefits the farm. And, and maybe years down the road, I'll, I'll head in that direction. Being involved with board, being involved with uh, everything you do and having livestock, you don't have a lot of free time. But uh, w when we have this magical thing called free time, what do you like to do? I think like most farmers, uh, you know, Free time also involves agriculture in some sort of way. Um, our our family is very involved in our local fair board, and primarily for myself, the local tractor pull. Just, just love the sport. Grew up around it and, and still love it. Love going to a pull every once in a while. I curl on a regular basis as well. So that, that really, um, it helps to get your mind off stuff quite a bit. Some Sometimes you just get out on the ice and, you know, it's like, the rest of the, the farm is, is left off at some time. Having said that, when you curl a bunch of farmers, you, you tend to talk about farming. So <laughs> it might only be for a few seconds, but you, you tend to just, just relax. That's the crazy thing about agriculture in small towns and rural areas. I think I curl too, and it's it's one of those things that I feel like, and I golf in the summer, and you want to leave the farm, you know, once a week or whatever you do, and you end up talking farming anyways, because that's just, that's <laughs> what we care about. It's what we enjoy. Yeah. Well, well that's, uh, that's it. And, uh, you know, my, my fiance is a, uh, uh, 
I, we, we call her an import, but, but she's a city girl come up to the farm and, and it's kind of funny because she, We'll, we'll get talking about farming and uh, she'll, she'll go, oh, here we go again. You know, <laughs> it, it's one of those things. Um, you know, you, you try and do something to get your mind off of stuff. But, you know, you work you work hard all day and stuff. And sometimes you don't want to go out and do much, unfortunately. So um, when the time's right, you know, we'll, we'll get away or we'll go do something, staycation or you know, been out to Calgary a few times or try and get a holiday in. Snowmobiling is something I'd like to do, but we don't get as much snow in as what, as what we used to around here. So it's kind of one of those things where if you want a snowmobile, you got to load the trailer and travel three hours and come back. And it's not something you can do just in between chores for something to do for a bit, which kind of stinks. But anyways, may, maybe things will be back in our favor within the next five years. You never know. Yeah, absolutely. They say the, the weather patterns are changing again. So uh, hopefully that for us in the prairies, that hopefully means some rain. And maybe that'll mean a little more snow for you guys next year. Yeah, yeah. You, you guys uh, seem to get the short end of the straw some years compared to us, even though we compare or complain about drought a bit. Uh, yeah, you guys uh, seem to have your own struggles. You know what, though? I think we're all kind of hard on each other when it comes to drought. Like, we always we always say, oh, wow, you know, they have it worse, or I can't feel bad about what I have because it's worse over in other areas. You know, it's all relativity, you know? Like, if, if it's dry for your area, it's, it's tough. Oh, of course. Of course. You know, we're, we're kind of in a, a weird pocket where it, it almost seems like the storms would either go north or south of us. And it and it's been tough, but then you you know you take a drive, you you travel two or three hours, and you know they're they're, they're struggling worse than you, so it kind of humbles you a bit as well to uh, to talk about it. As far as struggles go in the dairy industry, what would you guys say is is the biggest one you're facing right now? Oh, pro, processing capacity is number one. The lack of processing capacity and the ability to deal with excess products. It is the number one, and I think that's something that all levels of, of government and marketing boards need to get together and figure this out. It's it, it's starting to get tight, and the market demand is there. You, you look at butter demand; it is huge right now, and the the trouble is that dealing with the skim excess from the butter skimming process seems to be our biggest hurdle. So, getting that stuff put in place is the number one, and it's you know, you can sit on your hands all you want, but no matter what, you're three to four years by the time the plans are put in to get something together. And I think that's a problem with all processing capacity, not just dairy. You know, you, you look at abattoir capacity. That That's a big struggle here in Ontario as well. Those, that's the number one thing. That, that I think that the dairy industry really needs to focus on. Any advice for the, I mean, it, it's hard to say any advice for the next generation because, well, you, you are the next generation, but uh, for, for the up-and-comers, anything you would like to say? If you don't get off your own farm and experience another occupation, another job, go live, you know, three hours away or, or 13 hours away or, or get off the farm and, and work for someone else, learn from someone else, gain some new ideas. doesn't just have to be what relates to your farm. It can be something completely different. You can always take those skills from what you learn somewhere else and bring them back to your own operation. And I think it'll make you a more successful operator in the future if you pursue things that way. Well, that's a, a terrific note to end on, I think, Garrett. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You know, you're, you guys are my favorite ag media outlet, and I think we'll, we'll continue to be. Um, what you guys do is it, great for Canadian agriculture, and uh, always appreciate your guys' stories and insight. Well, that's terrific to hear. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sure we'll, we'll chat again soon. Great. Thanks again, Kara. And thanks, of course, to all of you who tuned into episode 14 of the Successors podcast. You know, I always say you can reach out to me if you have any suggestions on guests, but the same goes for topics. Anything specific you'd like to learn about on the Successors, send me an email, K-O-O-S-T-E-R-H-U-I-S at realagriculture.com. Until next time, stay real, and thanks for listening to the Successors. Successors.